He's about 455 yards away. He's going to hit about a two iron, I think. This is the School of Motion podcast. Come for the MoGraph, stay for the puns. Nobody can deny you what you deserve if you have the skills. And anybody can have these skills. You know, I mean, it's just like anybody can do this. I really think that it's for everyone. And if you work really hard, you get your reps in and and you get better. And maybe, you know, you can you can be that freelancer that you want to be or that artist that you want to be or that studio owner that you want to be because it doesn't it's I'm certainly not a rocket scientist. (laughs) You know, I just I worked really hard and I think that anybody can do this from anywhere. Back in November of last year, School of Motion took a field trip to Detroit, Michigan to check out a few studios and to shoot some video for our upcoming free course, The Path to MoGraph. One of those studios was Yeah House. And as soon as we walked in, I was struck by the friendly, chill, like almost family-like vibe that the studio had. And to my pleasant surprise, the studio was mostly female, a total anomaly in motion design, which look, it's no secret, is something of a sausage party. Now, in this episode of the podcast, we are going to talk about the gender gap in our industry. So Yeah House has been on a roll lately, putting out amazing piece after amazing piece, all with their own unique style. And a decent portion of that style comes from Michelle Ouellette, an illustrator extraordinaire and one of the co-founders of Yeah House. Along with her husband, Chad, Michelle runs a studio that handles small jobs, big jobs, cell animation, 2D explainer videos, a little 3D, and even some live action. In this interview, Michelle talks about how the studio formed, what it's like to run a motion design shop out of Detroit, Michigan, which in case you didn't know, is not New York or Los Angeles. We dig into her incredible illustration chops, and then we talk about the elephant in the room, the gender gap. Michelle was incredibly open and honest about her thoughts and experiences, and it's my sincere hope that this episode gets you thinking a little bit, especially you dudes out there. So get ready for a huge dose of inspiration and wisdom from Michelle Ouellette of Yeah House. But first, check out this story from one of our alumni. Hello, my name is John Shafe. I live in New York City, and I took the After Effects Kickstart class from School of Motion. I think the Kickstart class is awesome because it's basically just a a professional walkthrough of all the most important things that you'll need to do. I'm just jumping into the world of motion graphics, but I can already tell how it's added a little polish to the work that I do and giving me a more refined look. You you can build that confidence very quickly, and that's that's rewarding. Of course, I would totally recommend this course to anybody out there learning and trying to learn animation because it makes you feel like you're part of a community because you are. Even if you're just a student just starting out, there's other people out there just like you. Michelle, it is awesome to talk with you again. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. This has been a lifelong dream. I'm sure it has, <laughs> <laughs> as for most people. Uh, so why don't we start with this? Uh, you know, Yeah House has it feels like it from the outside um, has been starting to to get noticed more and more. Uh, I've seen your work shared on Twitter and, and places like that. And, and um, you know, we've we've shared some of your work on, in our newsletter and stuff like that. Um, and so from the outside, it, it sometimes feels like, whoa, this awesome studio just sprung up from nowhere and they're doing this amazing work. But I'm sure that's not what actually happened. So I'm wondering if you can give us like the quick history of Yeah House. How did you and Chad end up running this amazing studio? Well, first, thank you for those compliments. It's really nice. <laughs> um, well, uh, well, you know, Chad and I, we, we, um, we worked at like agencies locally. I had worked at a bunch of places and, and he had, and then I was working at a three, three D house being kind of unfulfilled. And so I would like said, Oh, I'm going to go freelance. And I worked for about a year. I saved up money and, and eventually, and he did the same thing. He went freelance a year before me and he saved up for a year and he, which kind of gives you a year to be like, man, maybe I don't want to do this, but we both eventually went freelance and he got a job with like a startup because there was like this tech startup boom around five years ago where all these tech startups were like, we need an explainer video. And so we're like, yeah, we'll team up, we'll do this. And so we essentially created Yeah House to just to like operate under. And we're like, yeah, we'll just stop doing this whenever, you know, the jobs stop coming in and they haven't stopped coming in. So (laughs) 
Yes. <laughs> pretty much how it goes. Yeah, yeah. I want to ask you about something because you mentioned you were working at a 3D studio and I saw on your LinkedIn profile that you got some sort of one year degree or something from, from a, sounds like a 3D program. Uh, and yet, yeah, House's sort of overall look and, and especially the kind of illustration that you do, I don't see any <laughs> signs of that. So I'm wondering if you could talk about like, you know, your, your dabbling in 3D and where that went. So I did like a, I did graphic design for a few years and then that was like a post, uh, post grad at, uh, Sheridan, which is near Toronto, it was like a 3D. And I'd always wanted to work in animation because I love animation. And I went there and I was like, man, after doing a whole year of animation, I hate animation. Like personally, it's it was like not my thing. And also at the time, which was 2005, everything was a lot more difficult than it is now. And so it was just like, I just hated it. Like I hated what came out. I hated that you had to have a team of, you know, 75 to 200 people just to create anything. And, and so I was, I'm glad that I did it. It was, it, it was an extremely difficult year. I, I had to learn Maya in eight months and my teachers took like a four week, uh, break during the middle. Cause they, um, they went on strike. <laughs> so I had to learn a lot of it myself <laughs> and it was really good discipline. And it was really, good learning how to work like that. And I met so many nice people. And because I, I am a Canadian person, um, my visa to work in the United States, I needed to have a four year program, like degree. And because I just happened to have that fourth year, I was able to come over here and work in graphic design. So um, I have used that portion of my education in different ways. But I did not enjoy it. So I don't do it. <laughs> and was was the thing you I mean you mentioned that you didn't like that you needed these giant teams to to do things which obviously if you're working in you know sort of the big budget world of like Pixar movies or DreamWorks yeah that's that's what it takes to do that kind of stuff but was there anything uh, you, you mentioned that um you know animation wasn't your thing and it's interesting because I'm I have tried Ver like many, many times to get into drawing and into illustration. And that seems to be your thing. And I just, I, it's never managed to hook me and I'm and animation has, I love animation. So I'm wondering, um, I'm just curious, like what was it about animation that you didn't like compared to what you you really do, you know, a lot of, which is drawing. Well, um, here's a tip animation or not tip, a, a thought animation is really hard. It's like really, really hard. <laughs> I found this out and I was like, wow, this is hard. And I just didn't have a love for it. It was <clears throat> the, the 3d side of it was no drawing at all. So I was not a fan of that. It was just like the whole reason I want to be doing anything is because I want to be able to use my hands and create some things. So there's no drawing. And then, um, <clears throat> with the, the, the traditional that we did, which was like, nothing. It was like a couple weeks to learn how to do a bouncing ball or whatever. I just, it was just very difficult. And it was drawing the same thing over and over again. And I've met people who do sell. And when I see them create something, you just see this like fire and this like thought process and the way that they, they like go through, you know, just this creation period. I just don't have that. Like, I just don't have that love. Like I want to create something and then I kind of want to create something else. <laughs> That's you're bringing up like a really interesting point. One of the questions I, I, I definitely want to talk about your illustration specifically and your style and all that. But one of the things I wanted to ask you and sort of like just for my own personal benefit is, you know, to get really good at something, do you have to love it? Um, you know, there, there's a lot of our students, I'd say most of them are trying to be generalists, you know, who can like design and animate and maybe edit a little bit and put the whole thing together by themselves because there's like that's that can be very lucrative and then you're very marketable if you can do that but you know like I can design I don't love it though so I, I and I'm not amazing at it either do you think that like that love you didn't love animation so do you think you could have been really really good at it like if you'd force yourself I don't think I could force myself. I mean, I, I mean, I guess if like I lived somewhere where that was my only way of eating, you know, it, but I just, I don't think that I could, I think I would be bored. And unless I found something where I found the challenge worked for me and maybe I was drawing differently and maybe I had a different experience. And I, if I had taken traditional animation, maybe I would have felt differently, but I, 
I don't know. You know, I, I, I think it would be very difficult to be like a super expert at something that you just don't enjoy at all. You know, I mean, I think you, if you find small things that you like really love and you add that in, then I think that's really exciting. But if you just hate it every day, it's like, I don't know, life's too short. You, you go do what you love. If it's like, maybe it's investment banking, you know? <laughs> Right. I think there's some really good advice in there about, you know, the, it's kind of a cliche, just do what you love, you know, and if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And, you know, that that sounds kind of idealistic. And no, Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, know, I don't. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little fantasy, but, 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 but I think that there, you, you've made a good point, which is like, if you're, if you don't love what you're doing, you're probably not going to become obsessed with it, which means you're not going to become really, really proficient at it. Yeah. Um, just because it takes the work, right? Yeah. And, you know, and I, I mean, I really would want to add that, like, I don't love drawing all the time. I love like 15% of it. There's certain things I love about it. And that's what keeps me, that's my drive. But like most of it is like, this is hard. This sucks. Like I'm getting it to a place like the drawing is not in the right place. Like I want to check my Twitter. Like, you know what I mean? Like you're just, it's not there. And you're just like, ah, I mean, I wish, man, it'd be nice if I just sat down and like, like butterflies came out of my screen. And I was just like, Oh, I just everything's so great. I just love every part of this process. Oh, you want me to do it again? Because the colors don't match what the client asked for. I would love to do that. (laughs) 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 That would be amazing. I wish that was I don't I don't know if that exists. Maybe it does. I, I would like to meet that person and mentor under them. Yeah, I suspect it doesn't, but I suspect it, it, it does help, if, you know, at least like to get to a, a high level with anything mm-hmm. if you enjoy it. So, OK, so I, would, I definitely want to come back to this drawing thing because I'm fascinated by it. But let's talk a little bit more about about the studio. So uh, so it sounds like you and Chad, you were both sort of freelancing and then all of a sudden this big job came in. And so you said, all right, let's take two words that sound cool together. Yeah, house, perfect. Let's spell house kind of like the German way and, and confuse everybody. And and what happened next? Like, how did you get from that one job to where you are now with this portfolio filled with work and, and you know, this really cool, like, small studio? Oh, um, well, there was – so I had mentioned there were a lot of explainer. There were a lot of tech companies that were coming out. And in Detroit, there was, like, a um, – Oh, what's it called? It's like, uh, they like invest and like buy little companies of, uh, venture capitalists. So they would buy, so there were tons of little tech places and they all needed explainer videos because they were like, you know, you couldn't understand what they did. And so we did one and they happened to be in this building that was like an incubator and they're just like, Hey, look at this cool video. You know, and we did it for really cheap uh, because that's what, you know, we didn't know what to charge for. We didn't know how much time it was going to take. Right. And then we did the next one and kind of doubled it to make it like a decent price. And then we did a few more. And then because we had this sort of small portfolio and it was a little different than, you know, a lot of what was out there because it wasn't just an animator. It was animator and illustrator coming together and bringing these two different skills. Um, And Chad has a whole background in audio and like just things that like, you need, but you don't know you need. And like, now it's a lot easier to freelance. But anyways, um, (laughs) so we had gotten, we had built up this small portfolio and then people from other places would be contacting us. They would see it on Vimeo. And then we had gotten a couple of like steady agency clients. And then as those agencies grew, our jobs grew. And eventually it just, we were, we were working like I don't know, like half the year, like we do a job and then take some time off. And I would do like a book and Chad would do, like an album and, and that was really wonderful. And then we're married. Um, so, and we had a child and so having kids is, is wonderful, but it's very expensive. <laughs> so, Correct. <yes. laughs> so it was like, it was like, we, we, we sat down and we talked about it and we're like, are we going to do this or not? Because we could go work at an agency and it would be a lot easier. It's very difficult to, I mean, to, to manage all the aspects of a business. You know, if I just want to do the creative, I could go do that. And so we said, no, we'll give it a real shot. And that happened to be the year that we ended up doing a lot more bigger jobs. We worked with a lot more people. We moved into a space and we hired um, Kaylee, who is like kind of like a producer. And she also has a brain to be organized, which I don't have. <laughs> um, and so it's it's sort of grown into this this really cool thing that we're 
you know, we started and we're a part of and we're able to work with people. Does that answer your question? I think I got lost. <laughs> well, I mean, it's funny because every studio owner that I talk to that has grown a studio from zero to something, it, it it's one of those things where it only makes sense looking back on it. Like, you know, at, at the time when you're, when you're trying to just hold on to the bull and not fall off it. There's not really a rhyme or reason to it. It's like, Oh, we got that job. All right. Well, I guess we need another computer. So here's the credit card, go get it. And like a and then in hindsight, you can sort of say like, well, this job enabled this to happen. And then that job enabled that to happen. Um, and so I, I want to say to everyone listening, um, you know, I've, I've been to a bunch of studios and walking into yeah house, it had a very distinct, like chillness to it. I think a lot of that has to do, Michelle, with you, your personality and Chad's personality. Like you're just super nice, warm, Aww, like chill people. Thank you. Um, but, but I'm curious too, because as you build a studio and, and, and a lot of studio owners, there's like a conscious effort to create some sort of studio culture or a vibe or a feel because it really influences like how fun it is to work there, you know, and, and when inevitably you have those late nights, <laughs> like you kind of don't feel so bad and, and, and it attracts a certain type of artist and the work reflects it. How much of that kind of small group of friends feeling is intentional and how much is just sort of, it just happened? You know, I, I'd say, a, well, I don't, I think that it's kind of like process of elimination, you know, like you work with somebody and we've worked with some people that are like amazing, but maybe like not the perfect personality type or for, for us, you know, or maybe a little bit more high strung or maybe they, you know, but we ended up keeping, we keep going back to the same people. We keep working with the same people because it's like you find people that you just click with and that, that work like you do. And I think that's kind of, you know, I mean, it's, I think what's really important is we work, I'm an honest person. I try to be fair. And I really hope that the people that we work with are the same, you know, and that they're nice. Cause I would just rather work with somebody nice than somebody who's like super talented and not as nice. <laughs> yeah. I, I want, I want to dig into that a little bit because that, that's something that I don't think is as obvious. Um, what, you know, to someone new to the industry, this, it, a lot of times it looks like a meritocracy. If you're good, you're good. And you'll be beating, you know, <laughs> you'll be turning away work in no time. Um, but you just brought up a good point in that, you know, like you have to be talented to, to work with you guys, but that's not enough. And I'm wondering if you can talk about like, what are, I don't know, without naming names or anything, like what are some things that have just happened or that lessons you've learned? Like, Oh shoot, we'll never do that again. Oh, there's so many. <laughs> um, <laughs> cause, cause a lot of things that, you know, I'm, we're learning as we go as well. And so it's kind of like you, you make mistakes. You know, if, I think like when we've worked with people, sometimes we find like certain people work better as a team. Like we'll work on these jobs. We, we just finished one in December and that took about 35 to 40 people involved in it. Wow. Which is a lot for us to manage and, um, and because there was a live, there was a live video shoot. It was a com commercial. And then there were, there was a giant animation component. So we work with Slack. So there are just some people that work really well as a team and they're really collaborative. It's just like, they're, they're good at, you know, like they share their dailies and they're just, and there are some people that work um, better by themselves and they, you know, like you could hand off uh, a whole, the whole animation portion of a project to them. And they would work better like that. And they'll just send you when something's complete. So it's, it's sort of like how someone works and because they're just, and, and certain people are appropriate for certain jobs and certain people aren't. And, and then also you'll work with people that you're just like, this person was super nice. And, but we just didn't feel like we were ever on the same page, which, you know, happens like, I mean, we're not perfect. We try to do the best we can, but we get overwhelmed and, you know, you just, <laughs> you, yeah. I think everybody feels the same, you know, and, and we've had like situations that didn't go really well. And it really was no one's fault. Like maybe the client was really stressed and they were like really pressuring us. And then we had to in turn kind of pressure the artist. And so it was like, it just didn't work out, but it wasn't anybody's fault. You know, it was a bad job. And often that in those situations, we'll work with them again and it'll be a totally different situation or situation, but <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, I always like to try and uh, for everyone listening, I try to, I try to dig out like, what's the takeaway here. And I can tell you from, from my experience, um, you know, the, the thing that has made 
me decide not to work with someone again. Like when I, I used to run a studio in Boston and, and it like, there's a lot of reasons and you just listed a lot of them, but one core one was learning how to take feedback yeah. well. And it sounds like maybe that, that is an issue that, that you've dealt with. And so when you when when somebody, uh, you know, is, is animating or designing something for you and you look at it and you're like, it's just not right. Yeah. And you tell them, you know, it, like, what, how do you think someone should approach? Like if they're, if you're given feedback that hurts and you know that it means I'm redoing it, how do you think about that so that it doesn't come across as like you're pissy because now you have to do more work, you know? Yeah. Well, and okay. So part of it, like, I don't like the, the thing I think that you, that everybody thinks about in, in most situations is we all walk around, we're sort of thinking about ourselves. And like when I'm, I don't want to give that feedback. You know, I want everything to come to me and look amazing so that I can be like, this is amazing. This was an amazing time. We're all amazing together. Yeah. You know, I think like when you have to give negative feedback, I think sometimes it's like, I try to find like a nice way to say it. So like, this is something I've learned in terms of working with people. A couple years ago, I would work really hard to try to find the nicest, most Canadian way to, <laughs> to say like, uh, this isn't quite right, but I would like sugarcoat it with so much language and like that, that they would walk away and be like, Oh, I barely have to change anything. And you know what, that, that worked really not in our favor and not in the artist's right. favor either, because they'd be, they'd think it was fine. And I'd be like fuming. And so <laughs> it, would, it would not really work. So I'm working more on being straightforward, but, um, you know, I, I think that like, Nobody wants to give that feedback. And sometimes, you, you know, I don't get things right all the time. So if somebody and clients aren't nice when they see my work and they're just like, this illustration is not right. It's kind of, you know, I don't like any of the colors. I don't know what you're thinking. I, and, and I have to hear that. <laughs> um, and so when when we get work that's not right, you have to, you know, you say like, well, this isn't working because A, B, C and D. And sometimes it takes more time and. I don't know. I, it's just, there's no good way. If somebody gets really upset with your feedback or just kind of like says, starts hammering back reasons why it's the way it is, it's like, it almost doesn't even matter, you know, why it is the way it is. It's wrong. So right. it has right. to be fixed, you know, and, and either they're going to fix it or we're going to fix it. And when we fix it, we're never working with them again. Cause it's just like, Oh great. This took twice as much work and we paid for it. Yeah. And you had to deal with, with attitude and pushback. And I think everyone listening, you know, it, it, it seems pretty obvious when you listen to this, like, yeah, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> but when you're in the moment and you just spent two days animating something and then you show it and you're like, oh, this is the best thing I've done. <laughs> and it, it's, uh, no, that's, it's, it's just not working. Let's try again. <laughs> Uh, and you have to eat that. You just got to like learn, learn to deal with that. Um, I want to talk about um, Detroit, Michelle. I want to, I want to pivot here and talk about Detroit. So when we visited Yeah House um, and, and a few other studios, Gunner and Lunar North and Vectorform, that was my first time ever in Detroit. And I was blown away by just how, how neat the city is. And there's like this cool scene for motion design. And, and I, what I was, what I was thinking was, you know, I, I get, told I, I've interviewed a lot of studio owners and artists and there is still sort of this lingering perception that there's something about New York and Los Angeles that allows those two cities to produce the best work. However, I look at the work that you guys are doing and it's just as good. And so I'm curious if, uh, if you feel any challenge being in Detroit, um, being able to compete with those studios in terms of getting work, but also just in terms of like keeping the bar really high? Well, I think that um, I've heard that the reason, like I have friends who work out in, in New York and, the, and I've heard that a lot of them say the same thing. Like, oh, there's just so much work that you, and there's so much good work that you are like, well, I can just kind of choose whatever. And because we're sort of further away and it's like, we almost have to work harder to compensate. Like, like, no, 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 we're, we're in the Midwest, but we're still really good. Like here, we're just going to work. <laughs> like, I know this was just like, I don't know, like say it was just like a explainer that no one's ever going to see, but I'm going to put my all into it because like, that's what we do here. And, <laughs> and I feel like we, I mean, I don't know, you know, I, th I think that like being somewhere like this, you, you get a few, you know, it's not as expensive. So you're able to do a little bit more. Maybe you can spend more money. You can take more time, whatever. But um, uh, yeah, I, 
I, I have a lot of thoughts on that. <laughs> well, well, let's start with this. So let's first talk about like challenges, if there are any. And one that I would imagine is a real challenge is just finding talent because, you know, in New York City or Los Angeles, you probably you know, can't throw, you can't throw a a Wacom pen without hitting an animator. But in Detroit, there's not that many people who are like, you know, really good at designing explainer videos and and animating them in After Effects. Um, So in terms of finding talent to work on these things and, you know, a a 35 or 40 person project, is that been a challenge? And how do you manage that? Okay, well, yeah. The, so there are a lot of people here that are really talented. Um, but sometimes you do need a specific skill set. And, and it, you can't find it, or it's not like to the level that that we need it to be, or they don't have the exact skills, you know, or there's only certain people who do that. There's like five people who do that. And you're just like, man, I wish there were more. But we, we've had a lot of luck working with people online. And I think the internet is amazing. <laughs> Yeah, and it's like I just think I it makes me sound so old, but I really think the internet's amazing. Like we can work with the best people in the world at any time, and people are available and they're reasonable. So it's kind of like, yes, it's you know maybe we can't have people in house as much as we would love, or you know because we need this certain three D that just is you know only so many people can do it, but people work online they're on our slack and like we have this like whole group of people that like we've never met in person but like we have a really good relationship with like one of them just had a baby and they moved and we sent them something they send us something bad it's just like I don't know I just think it's incredible it's like here's this whole it's it feels like the motion design community is is everywhere and you're just connected to people and I just think that's incredible (laughs) I think I'm really happy to hear you kind of, you know, say that you guys are on board with the remote working thing. I mean, School of Motion is a totally remote company that re- currently we have, including me, five full time people. And the five of us have never actually all met in person. It's as crazy wow. as that sounds. Um, and, and but we but it's the same kind of thing. Like, I feel I've met everybody, but like there's certain members of the team that have never met in person. And but we know each other really well. Um, I'm curious, you know, what are the what are the hardest skills to hire for? You mentioned that, you know, sometimes there's only five people that can do a certain thing. You wish there were more. What are the things that are hard to find people to do? I think, I think that there are people for everything, but I, th- I think that it depends on how clued into each network you are. And the problem with working in so many different, you know, we, we work 3d and cell and uh, we have a lot of illustration and, you know, it's, it's you can't be in every one of those Twitter groups, you know, and knowing who's available. I I find it very difficult. Like we have some people that we work with that do traditional animation and they're incredible. Um, but they, you know, there, there's not a ton because a lot of times the people who work in traditional, even if they are freelancers, like let's say they're in Atlanta or something, they, they have four month contracts with like adult swim and then they, they're off and then they have another four month contract. So we've have, it's a little bit difficult to find, that um and then also finding like you i mean we we talk to people all the time like we'll have somebody email us and it's like oh we really like our their work and then we'll talk to them to see if it's a good personality fit because it is if you are working remote with someone they have to be it's like they have to be a really good communicator you know and so that's also like i feel like that skill is just as important as your portfolio, <laughs> if you're going to work yeah. remote, because, you know, it's just, it's so difficult to, to read people if, if you don't know them, you know, if that yeah, I have actually written a book about freelancing. And that is like a huge, um, a huge part of it is that people hire people that they like and trust and that trust, especially when you're freelancing and especially when you're freelancing for a small studio that, you know, I I don't know what kind of budgets you're dealing with, but you're probably, you're probably in situations oftentimes where if someone works for two weeks freelance and they can't get it done, you're kind of screwed. And so there's this kind of, you have, you kind of hesitate to try somebody new unless they really make you feel like, um, you know, like you can trust them. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I hate trying out new people. I mean, I love meeting people. And if there was like a magical place that we all met and I could just like meet somebody, that would be the best thing ever. But I, whenever you work with somebody new, you just like, and I don't know how to communicate. How do they take feedback? But like, it's like you're on a job interview every single time. So if like we find somebody we work well with, I want to work with them forever. 
you know, they can't be our employee because we can't have, say, like a 3D person in here all the time because we just don't have a need for it that often. But like, I'm going to keep going back to them because like, oh, they're such a good communicator and they're really nice and they do great work. I want to work with them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and that that's the way to get ahead as a freelancer. Do you, th- do you think that you guys will, will try to stay like a small studio the way you are now and just keep hiring freelancers as you need? Or do you ever feel like eh, it would just be so much easier if we had a full-time cell animator and, and, and sort of envision a day when there's 15 people at your house? You know, I, so I just took a business class and like they had like, every time I would say something, like I have an idea, I think it would be perfect to have about five to seven people here because um, Chad is like, he's a director and I think he wants to pursue other, like we, we both, I mean, we're all artists, so we kind of want to pursue our art things. If I totally lost that and I just became a manager, which is kind of what the business class is like, you know, stop working in the business or on the business work in the, or uh, essentially don't do the work, you know, be a manager. Right. Be an, own, yeah, an, an owner, owner, not an operator. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. And, <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. and like, that's what they really want. And it's like, you know, I can't hire somebody with my skill set, so I should like manage people. It just doesn't make any sense to me. So I, I see us like maybe having like an executive producer It'd be nice to have somebody who could do sales because I'm not very good at that. And also, whenever we need to take time off, like right now, I'm four months pregnant, <laughs> and so I'm looking at like I'd like to take off a few months, and it's really really difficult because it's like how how are we going to do that? You f- you know you right, can, we can right. find a freelance art director, but like, it's just gotta be the right person. They got to come in house. They got to want to come to Detroit. It's going to be fall. It gets cold. You know what I mean? So it, if you can't step away from the business, that's a problem because then you're just working all the time. You can't even go on vacation. <laughs> yeah. See the, those business classes. I mean, Lord knows I've read, I've read a hundred business books and I've, I have a business coach and, and you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of wisdom to that, to be an owner, not an operator because of what you just said. Like if you're, if the business relies on you being conscious and <laughs> in a certain place, then, you know, it only operates as long as you're there. Um, but it's difficult when it's a creative business and it's built around the thing you love to do. Yeah. Uh, because then to grow it, you have to stop doing that thing. This is like a topic that's come up quite a bit. I, there, there was a an art like a guest post I did for Motionographer uh, a while back that talked about the same thing. Where you know I, I love being in After Effects, making things move. And all of a sudden I became a creative director and I was not doing that as much. <laughs> and I was doing conference calls and dog and pony shows and, uh, and it kind of sucked. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I wish I had, um, an answer for you and for everybody. <laughs> listening. <laughs> yeah. But, um, I, I mean, the, the, the good thing is now you, you, you've started Yeah House at a time when working remotely is just such a, an easy thing to do and you've built up your network and I'm pretty confident you'll figure out how to, uh, how to take a few months off. Um, (laughs) let's talk, let's talk about the drawing thing because, you know, one of the things we did while we were visiting Yeah House, uh, was I asked you to just draw something and let us film it. (laughs) And and you were, you sort of like, ah, okay, you put me on the spot. All right, fine. And then you just sort of effortlessly drew this little character and shaded her in. And it was just really cool. And you were talking the whole time. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm sure to you, it was probably no big deal, but like to, to someone who feels like I can't draw, I wish I could draw. It's kind of magic. <laughs> um, so I, 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 I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you got to be proficient at illustrating and specifically characters, which I think are a little trickier than just sort of like shapes, you know, like normal MoGraph stuff. Yeah. Well, I always, I I always have loved to draw. I wanted to go into illustration, but I come from like kind of a working class town and that was not an option. So I was lucky enough to go into graphic design and I was like, graphics is cool, you know, whatever. And I was like, Oh, I got this animation thing. I'm going to do the animation for a year. And I was like, Oh, it still isn't really what I wanted to do. So I moved back to the Detroit area and worked in graphic design and, and, uh, kind of, it was fine, but everything I would work on, it's like, I would try to turn it into an illustration project and they'd be like, this is nice, but Audi doesn't need this. Like, (laughs) 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 and you know, um, and then I worked at another place and it was kind of the same thing. And then I worked at this 3d place and that was a whole other thing. Um, and so I went to this, uh, 
this like illustration masterclass thing on the East Coast. And it wasn't exactly what I what I do it was for like fantasy artists, but it was like a week and it was sort of like a retreat, like a like a retreat where you go and you stay in a dorm and you paint for a week. And and um, and I saw Ian McKeg and he spoke. He's um he he did the art for Star Wars. I don't know if you're familiar, but he said, I've heard of Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you've heard of Star <laughs> Wars, but they are the, they are movies. Uh, anyway, um, but he had said something, and he said, you know, if you want to do this, like anybody can do this. You just need to. He said. He said, sit down and work for an hour every day for six months, and you'll get way better. And I also saw another artist speak, and he said, like talent is work you know, how much work you put into it, you get it back. And so I was so inspired by that simple thing that I was like, I went home and every night, you know, after work, and then most of the time I didn't feel like it, I would just sit and draw something and it wouldn't have to be, you know, I was, I was always really interested in characters and um, I worked really hard at it. And then after f- six months or a year, I, I was like, okay, I'm going to do freelance. And so there was this awesome program online, which they just stopped doing, which is too bad. But um, it was called Motivarty, And you would apply and there would be the possibility that you could be paired with an artist in like the animation industry. And I applied to be mentored by Mark McDonald, who is like this incredible character artist. He works and he teaches at Disney. And, um, I put so much work into this application. I built like a website. I made like a PDF comic. Like I wanted to be chosen (laughs) really bad. Um, and he picked me and he taught me basically like, it wasn't like rocket science. It was like, he would give me like a little assignment, you know, do like kind of something that you would see if you've ever seen the art of like Disney character books, like here's a 360 of a character or you know, but his like main lesson was like, you need to draw in a sketchbook, you need to draw every day, and you need to go out and draw. And like, that's, I got way, way better. And by like picking this up and making it a habit, if, by drawing all the time, I, I got so much better at drawing. <laughs> so, okay. So once again, there, there's not like a magic bullet, unfortunately, to get better. You just have to <laughs> draw every day. <laughs> Now, now, you know, when, when you draw every day, there's a lot of things that happen that make you better, right? Like you get probably better, you know, control, like fine motor skills and, and, and you're, you're better able to like have that vision in your head end up on a piece of paper. But, you know, looking at your work specifically and, and, you know, a lot of the characters and just like the gestures and the, and the, you know, the poses and the expressions, like you, there's so much movement in the way you draw. And I'm curious if there's any sort of mechanics that you picked up that you're conscious of that, that sort of help give your drawings that character, or is that just intuitive? Um, I think it's based on, I learned a lot by going to coffee shops and drawing people. And like a lot of times I would be really stiff so, cause you know, it'd be really nice to, to be able to tell you like, you just need to do this little thing or, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's where you, it's working at something for a long period of time and looking at your progress after a month, you know, not after a day or something. And I mean, I had, I took online classes. I'd take like one a year and I'd really put my all into it and I would improve an incredible kind of amount. I wish there was like something I could tell you that was like, just read this book. And like, or, you know, I, I copied a lot of things. I would see something and I would be like, I want to draw like this person. How does this person draw? And I would copy and I would look through the books and I would copy the books. And, and that really helped me improve, you know, like just finding things that I was really, really excited about that made me want to do it. And I don't know, like putting that on paper, that made me better by just kind of taking something and doing it. I, I wish there was an easier answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to ask you about something. It, the, you brought up something interesting, which is, um, you know, you got better by looking at things you liked and copying mm-hmm. them. Um, and there's a lot of people doing that. There's this sort of trend. I'm sure you're aware of it of every days. Mm-hmm. And, there, and, and a lot of people do it. And what they do is every day they'll share what they did mm-hmm. on Instagram or something like that. Um, and and it seems like there's kind of this built-in expectation of, oh, I hope everybody likes it. I hope I get some attention for this too. Not just showing that I'm practicing, but that I'll get like 
you know, likes for practicing yeah. or I'll get like maybe noticed because maybe something, some practice I did is really good. Did you share any of this stuff when you were, um, you know, drawing every day for an hour and copying things or was this just for you to get better? I shared it with Chad my dogs just loved it. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, you know, I, I have an opinion on that and, and I don't know if it's a popular opinion, but like I, so I, I still try to draw every day. Um, and I, I used to post my work on Instagram. I used to have like a blog and, um, that I found made me want to, like, I would copy more, I would think less, and there would be a lot of pressure, and it would be very unenjoyable, and I wouldn't want to do it the next day. So now I have my sketchbooks, and maybe if, like, I make something, and it turns out really well, I, I'll post, like, a Twitter thing on it or something, but for the most part, they're for me. Like, I don't feel, because then I feel like every time I sit down, I need to make this masterpiece and that's just not going to happen. Like most of the time I sit down and I draw something and it's crap and I'm just like, well, I don't feel bad because nobody else is seeing it and it's practice, you know? Um, but like, I, I don't know. I just, I don't want to sit down and feel like this is something that I have to do and it's not fun and it has to be amazing because I'm going to post it and people have to let, like, you know, it's, it's just not fair to compare myself to someone who like draws say like all day and they're, and they're in like, like maybe I draw a character and I like drawing characters, but there are people who just draw characters and they don't have to do anything else. And they whip out 15 and I'm just like, these people are amazing. And those people are probably looking at other people saying like, this guy's amazing. He does 47, you know, I, <laughs> I just, I don't know. I, I like the idea of, um, keeping it for me and like not, being judged on everything that I do because I don't know, I, 15 years ago, there wasn't the same internet sharing that there is now. Yeah. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of interesting things about this topic. You know, I think one thing is that if you're sharing everything, even your practice sketches, right. Mm -hmm. Um, then you're not really practicing the art of self curation, I guess. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to just be a hobbyist and you like to draw and it's fun for you, then that doesn't really matter. But if you're trying to do this professionally, I think that's really important. Yeah. Um, it's the same way, you know, when you're starting out and as an animator and you don't have a lot of stuff for your reel, you just put everything on it. But then once you've been going for a few years, you really need to learn to trim the fat mm -hmm. um, and put your best foot forward. So, um, and, and there's also the thing, you know, if, if you're an illustrator and you see some amazing thing, you know, that like some Stedman illustration or something, and you copy it to kind of just learn the mechanics of what it's like to draw like that, but then you share it, you can get accused of, of you know, plagiarizing stuff yeah. too, which, which has happened in our industry. Um, so I think it's really... I don't know if, if it was intentional or not, but you doing this everyday thing, but not sharing it, I think is is a pretty powerful lesson to anyone thinking that you have to share these things, that it needs to be public or it didn't happen. Pics or didn't happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, okay, so I want to, um, all right, I want to talk a little bit more about drawing. Um, I, I, everyone listening is probably like, enough with the drawing, but I really am fascinated. <laughs> I am fascinated by, by drawing. And I think too, like, you know, the, 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 the style that Yeah House has established is your style more or less. And it's, uh, it's cool because it moves away from what was really popular for a while, uh, which was like these sort of flat vectory looking things, which I know you, you're, you're not a huge <laughs> fan of. Um, and, and so I want to, I just want to like, I, I think that this style, the Yeah House style is going to be around and, and going to be more and more popular. Um, so first of all, when you draw now, you're still drawing every day. Are you doing any specific exercises or practicing certain things? Or do you just kind of sketch whatever's in your brain? Well, I do want to say our work here, while a lot of it is my illustration, Chad directs a lot of like the direction. Like we work together. So it's not totally my style. I would say that it's really right. like kind of a culmination. Um, well, uh, a lot of times it depends on why I'm drawing. Um, I don't have a lot of time. I mean, I know nobody has a lot of time, but like I have, um, my son is not a good sleeper. He's two and a half and he wakes up like after an hour and cries. And so like I get from 8 p.m. to like 8 45 9 o'clock maybe 9 30 if I'm really lucky if I want to sit down so and like draw something and usually I have like a show on or something um so it depends on how tired I am <laughs> a lot of times like 
I like to d- just kind of draw to unwind. Um, I'm really into the Olympics. And so lately I've been drawing like, you know, Olympic uh, athletes and they're opposed and, and it's, and um, which is a really great way to like look at the body because they're rarely wearing like tight, tight things. That's what I'm into right now. But sometimes, sometimes I'll work on things. Most of the time, if I'm going to sit down and draw, it's always in the evening, it's, it's always um, something that's by hand. Uh, sometimes I'll work on ink. I really like watercolor, but generally it's just whatever I kind of want to do that, uh, that is fun. Sometimes I'm looking on Instagram, I'm like, man, I love this. And then I want to do something like that because I'm excited about it. And hopefully I have enough time. <laughs> but yeah, I, I used to do exercises, but now I'm not, I just, it's like my time to myself. So I just try to do something that I enjoy. And who are some of the illustrators that you admire now that, you know, you kind of look up to and like, man, they're way better than me. Oh, oh, I'd have to look at my Instagram. There's just like so many people that are creating like really, really amazing work. You know, I, I like a lot of, um, there's like a lot of background. I, I know you're looking for names. I'm not very good at, <laughs> at, at like recalling things at the drop of a hat. Um, because I can't remember anything anymore. Um, are there any style or like, you know, are there any techniques or styles or any kind of, you know, trends you, you're seeing that are cool? Oh, you know, I love um, a lot of the people that I love following um, are really like comics, comic artists. Um, there's Dennis Salvatier. He's, he's out of LA. He does like a lot of, he, he does a lot of hands like, or pencil on paper. And then he finishes them and makes these stickers. I love I mean, Raphael Mayani from Giant is like, oh, yeah. he's oh, incredible. Yeah. I mean, everything he Legit. makes is incredible. I'm like, man, he's just like a magic person. Uh, <laughs> and then there's a lot of artists that I follow that like, like Nicholas Illick, um, just like people that work at, the, they work out West, they work in like Disney studios, a lot of the, or like Disney or Pixar or DreamWorks or they're, um, they, uh, they work in the studios as visual development artists because that's what I'm really into. So I seek out, I just, I follow so many of those people. Cause I'm just like, it's so amazing. They like, and, and when I look at them, I'm like, wow, I wish I could draw like that because <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. But there, there are just so many people out there right now. It's not a very specific answer. <laughs> well, I guess like anyone can just go to your Instagram and look at who you're following. Probably. Yeah, that <laughs> would just be follow the best. Those same people. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Okay. So now let's uh, let's move into something that I'm I'm really curious to get your take on. And that's um, so when we walked into Ya House, one of the first things I noticed was that it was very different from I think every other studio I've been in, in that there were mostly females working. Um, and it's no secret. We've, we've done a survey. There's been other surveys done. It's no secret that motion design is a very male heavy, just in terms of the, the, there's more males working in it than female. There's been a lot of conversation about that. Um, and I, I'd love to hear from you. I mean, you and Chad, you know, you're, you're still only a few years into this thing. Um, but, you know, you're a a female studio owner and there was mostly females there working artists as well. Not just, you know, the traditional thing is that females, there's more female producers than male producers. There's more male animators than female animators, but it's not how it is at Yeah House. And I'm curious if, if that's like a conscious effort, you know, or if it's just sort of the way things have worked out and, um, you know, if you just kind of get your thoughts on that. I would say that it's conscious. Uh, we, when we look at people, I, I just think that there's, I think that if you have, like I've worked at places and, and I would, so I worked as a motion designer for a couple of years and I worked with all men and I worked in a 3d house and I worked with a lot of people and they were all men, unless they were like a secretary or HR kind of position or producer. Um, and that was a lot of people, all men. Um, and I just thought like, that's not what I want. And I think that having only one type of person, like mostly, you know, very little diversity, if any at all. Um, and all men is only going to have, there's only going to be one story, you know, like one way to tell a story. There's a a style and there's a color palette. And, and so we, when we look at bringing someone on, um, especially like intern or, or like designer or whatever, we, we do really, uh, think about that because I, I don't know. I just, I never, ever, ever want to work at a studio that's 
just all one kind of person because it doesn't make for good work. I don't think. I mean, it, there's there's a lot of great work that happens, but I just think that if it's if everyone's the same, how can you, you know, tell any story that hasn't been told before or something like that? <laughs> that's a, that's a really good point. And there's, I mean, there's been tons and tons of studies, like scientific studies, about the positive effects of having you know a diverse staff, a diverse team. And I think you're right. I think we all, you know we all have a blind spot to that sometimes, you know, we sort of think like, oh, well, I'm a, I'm a progressive minded person. I can imagine what it's like to be, you know, a minority female. Well, no, I, I can't really. And so it's, it's great. I think that, that that's a conscious effort um, on the part of you and Chad. And another thing that is interesting to me. So when you look at Yeah House's work, and I'm, I'm going to try to I'm going to try to avoid stepping in landmines here. <laughs> like, I, I was, let me, I'll tell you a quick story. So w- at my old studio in Boston, we once had to do a project for progressive insurance and their spokesperson is Flo. I'm sure you're familiar with Flo, right? The, the kooky lady that, that's on all the commercials. And we were going to make an animated version of her for this spot. And my art director, Mike, um, who's male, obviously, (laughs) he's a trained illustrator. He's like amazing at illustrating. And he drew some character designs for this and they just didn't look right. It wasn't right. And he he said, you know, I think we need to hire a female illustrator for this. I'm not going to be able to get this. And it was the first time that, um, you know, a professional artist had said something like that. And it kind of got me thinking like, it, it makes sense. Male and females were different, right? And I'm curious if if you agree with that in terms of like the artistic output has a different flavor to it. Yeah. And if that's something that that you're conscious of it, yeah, house, it makes your work look different. Well, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it does, it, who, who's creating the work? Like, I mean, especially when it's, like the last project we had was really illustrative. So it's kind of like, who's creating it is kind of there. Like that's who's in the work, the color scheme, like what appeals to them, what sort of situation, where, where it's viewed from, like in terms of height and where someone's sitting and how they see things, it's, it's going to be totally different depending on who created it. And, um, Yo-Yo, she was uh, from China. She interned here and she had to go back to school, sadly, but she, um, you know, comes from a totally different background. She would paint these things that like, you know, I would say like, okay, here, we need this kind of background. And what she would come out with, she would pick these colors that like, I could never choose. They were just like, you could tell they just had a different flavor to them. And I just, I loved it. It was so incredible. It was like, I would never put these things together and they look amazing. And, and you know, having somebody else who can do that and like can bring that with them and say like, you know, it's, she's essentially bringing, you know, all the things she's seen and, and putting it into the work that we're, that we have. So by having people who think differently or who are different, I think you get different work. (laughs) Yeah. I've said the same thing, uh, about, you know, there's so many amazing designers and animators from South America, you know, Brazil Mm -hmm. and Argentina and, and, and the, the look and the, and the, the vibe and the colors that come out of those artists are things that just, they're like thoughts that I've never had. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and it, I think for a lot of people, it's obvious how that would happen if you grew up in, you know, Buenos Aires versus Fort Worth, Texas versus um, Canada versus China. Um, but if you have two designers who both grew up in Detroit, Michigan, and one's male and one's female, I think that there's a tendency to say, oh, well, it, given equal levels of talent, their their work output will be, you know, comparable. Um, so I'm curious if you ever find situations where, you, you know, uh, you and Chad are talking about a job that just came in, there's a brief... Do you, do you make decisions like, you know what, I think that having a female illustrator design these characters makes more sense because that makes sense for this brand versus, you know, sort of more stereotypical. Maybe this is more techie. Maybe a male designer is going to get there quicker. Do, do you, do, is that, is any of that true or is it really a personal thing and, and gender doesn't matter? Well, um, I don't think we've ever had that conversation, although it is a really interesting point. We, we, I mean, you, you want to find who the best person for the job is that maybe, and on top of that, who's also available 
to you. <laughs> um, <Right. laughs> but like, you know, I, so I think like, yeah, if, if, I mean, if it's super, like, there are just certain things that I'm not good at that I'm not going to be a good, like, if I was to illustrate it, it's like, well, it's just going to turn out kind of girly, you know, and it's for like men's deodorant with Superman things. And it would just like, right. <laughs> you know, not maybe not be the right flavor. Um, but when we, when we do think about a project, we do think about like, who would be the best person for it, you know, and also like you try to choose people. I mean, a, a lot of times we go back to the same people because we love them. <laughs> and once you work with right. somebody, you're just like, Oh, I love this person. I want to work with them on every job. Let's see how we can make it work. And when you're talking about art direction, it, it really is specific to what the product is. So maybe I wouldn't necessarily think like, I'm going to look for a, like the demographics, like a male who's in this age group, who's doing this, but it probably would be something that I would find without like putting that together. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, I know what right. the flavor profile is. So like, that's kind of what I'm looking for. Even if I'm not like putting it on paper and saying, this is exactly what we need. Right. You're not sort of picking the ingredients, the yeah. right ingredients for the correct art director, but th there is some truth to these I guess, stereotypes, you yeah. know? Yeah. And, and you brought up another good point, which is a big part of this is who's available. And, you know, uh, it, it, it's interesting because, um, it seems like every time I hear a number, uh, you know, male versus female talent in this industry, it's getting more and more equal. It's still not equal. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm imagining that that also makes it harder to hire female artists just because there are less of them. Um, you know, and since yeah house has sort of made this conscious choice to have, you know, not have the, the traditional <laughs> Sasha's party that <laughs> the most studios turn into, um, has that been a challenge like to, to find female, I would imagine like animators yeah. probably that's where there's, the, the, it's really noticeable. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm going to be honest. If I look at like, we, we have worked with several female cell art, cell animators. There are lots of like really great cell people we've been able to work with. Um, but as far as like after effects animators, I don't think we've worked with it. Uh, we worked with one. There's just, you know, you, you have to like, we are a small studio. We do have a budget. There are business concerns. So it's like, well, you know, what can we do if I'm going to choose between this person and this person, and one's male and one's female, it probably will also come down to like, who do I like more? Who's willing, who, who has the availability? I mean, you know, it, it would be nice to be able to choose like, but there, there's only so many people who are working freelance and are available and are in the price range and are, you know, like maybe we have a time difference kind of thing that we need to work at. I, I, there's just so many factors. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you sort you just kind of do the best you can. And, and I think, you know, it, it seems like everyone in the industry is sort of working towards the same thing, which is getting to a point where there's, there's just enough male artists, there's enough female artists, everyone has the same equality of opportunity. And, and then companies like Yeah House can, you know, can, can pick the best, most appropriate person for each job. So, so thank you for being honest about all that stuff. Another issue that I'd like to get your take on, and, and it's, it, uh, by the way, congratulations on uh, impending baby number two. <laughs> thank you. Definitely, it definitely doesn't, doesn't make it easier. No. <laughs> um, no, but um, there, I, I've heard a lot of stories and, and, you know, I've said on this podcast before, like I, I, I it's very hard for me um, to talk about this stuff. I just have no experience. I'm a white dude. I'm like as, you know, as vanilla as it comes in the United States. You know, I, it's obvious though that, that females have a very different experience than males in this industry currently. Hopefully that'll change, but I'm curious if you've had experiences and it sounds like you had, um, as you were coming up in the industry that kind of left a bad taste in your mouth that maybe led to this decision to not have, you know, an 80% male studio. Yes, I could, I could. Well, I've had um, Nerf things uh, aimed at my head. Uh, no, shot at me. When everybody had Nerf guns, because that was a really fun time. People have played porn at work. Oh my God. I've had people totally ignore my opinion. And it was like, obvious, like you would look like other person, like guy who's saying like this, this and this. And then I would say, but that might not work because, you know, because I was uh, at the one place I was 
the only person who used After Effects. And I said, this would be so much easier. And that was totally ignored. I've been yelled at. I've been, oh, oh I worked at a job. And uh, I worked with this guy. He was older. And he, um, he didn't, there are just a lot of people that don't like females to have an opinion or to have a voice. Like they shouldn't, you should just be sitting there and be nice. And that's your job. And uh, I worked at this place and I can't work in like a pitch black room. Like I need a little bit of light, even a lamp. It just gives me a migraine to like look at a screen. And I don't, I don't know if I'm alone, but whatever. Um, and this guy had said like, I would go in in the morning cause I was always earlier than everybody. And I would just kind of crack the window, like just a little bit. <laughs> Right. So that there right. be, a little bit of nature yeah, just a little bit of light like it was not <laughs> just a yeah taste. it was not like it was blinding and he complained and they moved me out of the area away from everyone and into a corner i was literally moved like, into oh the God. corner <laughs> like in a different section of the building like where nobody sat <clears throat> because you know it yeah, it, it sucks. And like, there's like certainly a bias and there's, and I think there's a lot of people that mean well, and they don't really know that they're kind of sort of treating people like that. But I think that part of the problem is having only one voice and you have an overwhelming type kind of like s sort of person. And so you don't even see everybody else. And how can you, you know, I, I don't think they were bad people. I just think you know, <laughs> I don't right. want to have, I don't want to go to work in a place like that. Um, do, you, do you have any thoughts on whether that kind of, I mean, it's obviously like bad behavior. <laughs> is it, is, is it a generational thing? I mean, was it sort of like, you know, the, the older, the older people, the older artists were different than the younger artists or do you, do you think it's any, any deeper than that, you know, just sort of like the culture of this industry. I'm curious if you have any thoughts where, where that comes from. Well, okay. So I have a tendency to put my foot in my mouth. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm going to try to not do that. But, um, <clears throat> I think that, I think that certain, I think that sometimes some people get more opportunities than other people. And I don't think that, I mean, that's what they call, like, if you look at, say, like, like the, the issue of white privilege and, and what a pri what privilege is and privilege is invisible, like you can't see it, you know, and, right. and I am a white female. So I am certainly like not seeing everything that is happening to everyone else. So, but like, I know how I've been treated at places and it wasn't like what that, that guy who had me move to the corner, he was older, but the people I worked with weren't another job that I worked on. I worked with this creative director and he wanted me to do their website, like to design it. And I literally made 87 designs, 87 different website designs, which is a lot, <laughs> you know, and, and he just like, sort of like, I just had so I, I really tried to make what he wanted. He would come and give me different direction every time. And then at the end, he just sort of gave up and he's like, well, this is just isn't working. So he gave it to another guy. And the other guy made something that I did like on the first round. And, and he's like, this is what we were looking for. And it was just like, you know, I don't think anybody meant it. They weren't bad people, but like, you know, it just, I don't know. Right. And it, yeah. And, and, and in, in that situation too, it's, it must be hard to kind of like, to, to figure out what's actually happening. Cause it's such a subtle form of, of kind of. I guess discrimination is the word. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know what the right word is, but it, but it's more subtle than like, you know, Oh, like, you know, you're, you're being loud. Like I'm going to move you to, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to move you across the room because you like light and you don't want to be in the yeah. dark. Well, and it was <laughs> just like, you know, I, I think that I think what happens in that situation is like, I wasn't going to complain because I always thought the problem was maybe I was too vocal. Maybe I was too young, you know, um, because at, at the first job where they had me just do like 87 website designs, I was 23. Um, and maybe it was like an age thing or, and I don't really think it was, I, I think it was a female thing, but, um, uh, you know, I just think, I think what people do is they leave. I left, I left the next job. I left the next job and it was like, I'd stay there. And then, you know, I, I didn't know how to handle it. And part of it I'm sure is my fault and how I d dealt with things where like, I was just going to be like, well, if you're going to act like that, then I'm going to cross my arms, you know, which is not very an adult, an adult way to, to look at things. But like, I just, I don't know, you know, none of us are perfect. And I'm sure that they weren't perfect and they didn't mean it. But like, 
it was just like crappy. I didn't want to leave and yeah. I just had to because it was like, well, this isn't going to work out. It's just going to be the same problem. But they all closed. I win. <laughs> <laughs> you got the last laugh. <laughs> well, you know, you, you brought up a really good point in that I think – I mean, and again, I don't really have any like real experience with this, but just from sort of observing and, and having some conversations, it seems like there is, of course, like overt, straight up discrimination like that happens. But I think that most of it is is more insidious than that. It's like it's these it's these blind spots that we have where we don't realize um, and when I say we, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking the, the for general, like we, we, you know, it, it, it's, it's easy to, you know, it's like the mansplaining thing. Like you feel like you're helping somebody out. It's really, <laughs> you're just con- you're being condescending. Um, and, and so I'm curious, you know, um, you know, a, a, as, as a male artist in this industry and I really, I, you know, I love seeing studios like, yeah, House. I love what you guys are doing. Like what can male colleagues of female colleagues do? Like, just be aware of it. And, and, you know, I'm sure like 95% of people are doing everything correctly and are not discriminating at all. But there's these unconscious biases we all have in these blind spots. I'm curious, Michelle, if if there's any, you know, any things that you see that like you feel like, you know what, I don't think they are meaning to be kind of discriminating, but they kind of are. Maybe it'd be nice if that was different. Well, and, you know, I think that like, so the in the places I had worked before were not like this. And and I think a lot of the people that I meet in in like the motion design kind of thing, like everybody is super nice and they mean well. And I think everybody's really trying, kind of like you had said, you know, I don't think anybody means to be whatever, but I, I think that like paying attention like if you if you have, say, like if you only have one female employer, if you only have a couple you know, making sure that everybody gets equal time to speak. And I know it's kind of a pain in the ass, you know, it's just like, oh, do I have to do more work for this? But like, I I just, I don't know how, you know, if, and if people, I think that if people leave, you know, if you look at who stays and who leaves and you're just like, oh, this is some kind of problem that I have that I, or that we have, how do we address this? Like, what are we doing to maybe make people uncomfortable, you know, more comfortable or, whatever, you know, you don't want a sterile work environment where nobody can make any jokes and nobody can say anything. But the other side of that is making people uncomfortable or whatever. So I I don't know what a like a specific thing is. But I suppose, you know, making sure people have equal time to speak deciding like, am I giving this project to like the right person? You know, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know what the answer. I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, it kind of sounds like just being aware of it maybe is is kind of a good first step because, you know, I mean, when, when you have a studio, I mean, you, you had a really good example of like, you know, you, you, you said something and and then 87 versions later a man said the same thing basically. And, and, Oh yeah, that's brilliant. That's exactly what we need. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it, it's like just being aware of it hopefully can prevent, um, that, that situation from coming up. I think that studio owners, uh, you know, now as they think about studio culture, this is like way more on the radar than it was a few years ago, especially with like, you know, that the Me Too movement and everything going on now, like there's just, it's kind of like it's in the, the zeitgeist right now. Like the, everyone's aware of this. And, um, and I really appreciate you being like honest about your, um, you know, your experiences. I'm curious. So as a, as a studio owner, um, and you're in a unique position too, because it's, it's you and Chad. Mm-hmm. And so you've got, you know, like male, female power couple running a <laughs> studio and do you, have you seen, you know, clients treat you differently than Chad? Have you seen anything like that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, we have sometimes, I don't think sometimes, or sometimes I don't think that it's personal. Like, it's not like I don't like women, but I think sometimes like I work, we work with these people and like one, it's like a team and one of them seems like that. I, they both like talking to me, but like the, the female, she calls me all the time. And, and I think that that's just because we sort of relate to each other really well, right. you know, and also we're around the same age and we've also had a lot of similar experiences and, you know, I, and so I don't think it's all bad. And sometimes it's easier. Like we've worked with agencies before and they just sort of defer to Chad and it's like, you know, sometimes it's annoying and I, it's just like, you're like looking at them and they're looking at like, they're, you're asking about something that maybe I do or that I handle. And then 
but you just, I don't think it's a, a lot of times it's not on purpose. <laughs> and it's just like, well, if they're more comfortable with him, then uh, less work for me, I guess. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but see that you see, so you brought up one of my hobby horses, which is ad agencies. And, you know, the, I, I most of my career was spent like doing work for ad agencies. <laughs> And it's really interesting to look at the contrast between the, you know, the, the big city ad agency world, like Boston, where I came from, or New York or something like that. Detroit, I know, has a big ad agency scene because of the, all the car stuff. Um, and that culture, you know, I mean, just watch Mad Men. I mean, it's not exactly like it that anymore, <laughs> but it's not that, it's not that different either. <laughs> Um, and that comes from the top down. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've seen, hu- you know, I've worked with huge agencies and the best ones aren't like that, but there's still some really big names where it's like, it's male dominated and it's not just male dominated, it's alpha male dominated. Yeah. And you push things through by being the loudest, most aggressive voice. Um, and, and so it kind of creates this scenario like that. Um, so that's frustrating to hear. I mean, so, you know, I can say, I can tell you like in the motion design community, there's a huge effort to not do that. Yeah. Um, it, you know, when you talk to people like clients, you know, like, like, like this, this woman at, at this ad agency, is there a, a version of this conversation happening over there? Do you think? Um, you know, I don't know. They're, they seem really overwhelmed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know if they're thinking. There's that, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, a lot of places that we've worked with, they've, you know, it, it is a lot of men and you're working. And, and it's kind of like, you know, kind of the bro sort of thing. And I'm not a right. bro. <laughs> <laughs> but then also sometimes people want to talk to me because they they think like I do a certain job, which often is correct. Like, like I'll handle say like billing or whatever. Um, and they will be, and you'll, you'll have a certain, like they'll defer to me. They like to speak to me because of, because of that. But then they'll talk to Chad about certain, th- I, I don't know. You know, it is, it is certainly a top down type thing. And, 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 but I think that there's a lot of new agencies, a lot of smaller, like kind of like, like we're a motion design, sort of a production studio but I think there's a lot of smaller digital agencies that are coming out right now, sort of like the counterpart agency and they're run by like people who are younger, maybe a more diverse crowd of people. And I think that that's, it's, it's inspiring a lot of hope in me. <laughs> oh yeah. There's, there's definitely change in the air and it, cause it sometimes feels like it, it's not happening fast enough, yeah. but I, I do think you're right about that for sure. Have you know, sort of, you, you, you know, as a studio owner, you always have to think about the future of the studio and, and plan ahead. And, um, you know, you mentioned you're pregnant with number two and you want to take a few months off to sort of deal with what's about to happen to you <laughs> <laughs> again. Um, and, and I mean, this is one of the areas where truly, you know, men and women have just very different experiences when it comes to the birth of a child. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I'm curious if you've thought about like, you know, how to make that work. Um, I talked, I've talked with, uh, Lillian Darmona, who's another amazing illustrator on this podcast before about this and how it's, it's difficult to be a woman in this position because you are, at least in the U S our, our capitalist society is not really set up to just put work on hold for three to four (laughs) months. Um, and, and, and I'm curious if you have any thoughts on how you might manage that or how you wish you could manage that. Uh, well, uh, for Leo, our first, um, I think I took off a couple of days <laughs> and then, uh, I had my family help us a lot and we were all yep. in the house, so I'd be in the same house, but like I had to work, there really wasn't, and we weren't in a position where we could just take off the time. Um, right. this time we're hoping to maybe get like somebody who can come in for a few months because we're in a different position, but like, I mean, it's hard, you know, and, and, um, and like, I'm not a big n- newborn person. <laughs> it's, it, like, <laughs> I just like, I, it's just very difficult. It's like once they start to like do things and like talk or like move around or smile, it's like, Oh, you're like a little person in there. It's so incredible. But yeah. at first it's just hard and there's a lot of sad tears for me. Uh, <laughs> but, um, I, I think that you just kind of do what you can, you know, and especially when you own a business and I think it's any kind of business. And even if you're a freelancer, you know, that's owning your own business. Um, it's just like you do whatever you can, you take off as much time as you can. You try to spend as much time as you can at home. I mean, I was 
part-time with Leo for about six to eight months, but it was still like when something needed to be done, I had to do it. And I, and sometimes it is nice to take like a few hour break outside of the house. Just, you know, <laughs> yeah, I don't think I've ever taken more than a week off for the, I've, I have three children and, um, yeah, I think the first one I took a week off, I just started a studio and, uh, mm-hmm. and it felt like, gosh, it would really be nice if there was some system in place to, yeah. <laughs> to like, let me not work for a little bit and not have the entire company fall apart. Yeah, well, um, yeah, for sure. Well, and I'm, I mean, I'm Canadian, you get a year off. But even if, but if we owned our business in Canada, it wouldn't be any different. Like there's no right. person yeah, going to show up and be like, I'll do your job. Go. Right. So <laughs> there's sort of, there's sort of like two overlapping like challenges, which is like newborn, you know, the mother of a newborn and entrepreneur business owner. Mm-hmm. Um, so you really, I mean, fr- you, frankly, you're asking for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do both those things. Uh, that's so awesome though. Um, all right. So my last question for you. Um, let me gush for a little bit. So like, I really, you know, what I hope comes out of this conversation and again, thank you for like all your honesty and the stories and everything. I hope that this just is like a one more little push uh, for the industry in the right direction. Just being aware of these things, you know, I think uh, most people are, but it's always good to hear like real experiences that are not like yours at all. Um, and you know, the, like most of my friends in the industry are, are male and they can't relate to anything that you said about being discriminated against and stuff like that. And it's really good to, to hear that and know that it exists. And I think that it, you know, at the, you're at the point now, I don't know if this is overstating it, but I think you probably are something of a role model, Aww. Michelle, you're running a studio, you're super talented and the work that comes out of your house is awesome. And the culture is awesome. So I'm wondering if you have any advice out there for, female artists listening to this that, you know, ha- maybe have some stories like yours and f- are a little discouraged by how male dominated everything still is. What would you tell them in terms of like succeeding in this industry and in- accomplishing your goals? Well, well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I would, I would say that, that anybody can do this. Like I'm not a magician. Um, I just, uh, worked really hard. I didn't go to a fancy school. Um, I got a lot of like my, like the education that I use to do my job right now. I got it online in classes kind of like yours and like, yeah. uh, Well, and you know, online classes and, and, and I got better by really working at it and nobody can deny you what you deserve if you, if you have the skills and anybody can have these skills, you know, I mean, yeah, within reason, I guess, but like, it's just like anybody can do this. I really think that it's for everyone. And if you work really hard, you know, you can, you can, you can attain, you can, you can get those, you can, you get your reps in and, and you get better. And maybe, you know, you can, you can be that freelancer that you want to be, or that artist that you want to be, or that studio owner that you want to be, because it doesn't, it's, I'm certainly not a rocket scientist. (laughs) You know, I just, I worked really hard and I think that anybody can do this from anywhere. And what's so amazing about the internet is like, you can work with anybody from anywhere. And I want to work with the best people in the world because I, I want to be like them. (laughs) I want to, I want to see what they do. And, and, and I don't think that anything is stopping people right now. You know, there's inexpensive classes, there's, you know, working really hard, there's putting your time in. And I, that's, I, I really think it's for everyone. And I don't think anybody should feel like, oh, I'm this kind of person. So it's not for me. You know, it's tough to talk about this stuff sometimes. And you could probably tell that I was trying really hard to choose my words carefully and to treat this topic with the gravity that it deserves. And I'll be honest, I was a little nervous to bring this stuff up, but I really think that honesty in our industry is the key to closing the gender gap. Males and females are different and we're all gonna have different experiences in life in in our careers, but there is no excuse for the behavior Michelle and probably any female artist has experienced. Hopefully being more aware of the issues and the potential for even unintentional bad behavior can push the needle a little bit in the right direction. So thanks again to Michelle for coming on and speaking about this. Make sure you check out Yeah House's work at yeahouse.com. That's Y-E-A-H-H-A-U-S.com. And you can see her illustration work at michellecandraw.com. And it's awesome. All the stuff we talked about in this episode will be 
in the show notes at schoolofmotion.com. And that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. And I'd love to know what you think. Uh, Hit us up at School of Motion on Twitter or shoot us an email, team at schoolofmotion.com. And that's it. Rock on, people.